now that I have all my technical bits attached to me and figured this out, first I want to say I'm very excited about being here, really nervous. I'm not a librarian, so bear with me. Um, I've taught through the K-12 system, both elementary, secondary. I've worked as a resource teacher both for elementary and secondary. I've spent my time with gifted students through um, you know, summer programs, through administration as vice principal, principal, and I ended up as the district principal for Aboriginal education. It's one of, one of those positions that sort of found me. I was a little hesitant you know, to get into the role because I always thought, well, somebody else can do this job better than me. And it just, it's one of those things that you just kind of go, really, you're asking me to do that? And I feel the same way today. It's kind of like, really, you're asking me to do this, to speak to you? So I thought about what I need to present. And I want to talk about the why do you want to pick Aboriginal books and the how do you go about it and to remove some of those, maybe some hesitations about just being a little nervous about picking out materials. So first of all, you know, what does it look like and how do we make it happen? How many of you know about the Aboriginal Education Enhancement Agreements? We got a few hands in the room. Well, for probably at least 12 years, the Ministry of BC, through education, has created Aboriginal Education Enhancement Agreements. And what those are are five-year commitments with school districts, with Aboriginal communities, with the First Nations bands within the, their school community area, and all of the various parties within a school community. And the commitment is, what do we need to do to ensure Aboriginal students are successful? And what does that success look like? And what do we need to do, not just for Aboriginal students, but for all students? How do we get the materials that are you know, appropriate in the hands of all students? So it's a five-year commitment. It focuses on you know, academic, but the other areas. They're to increase knowledge and understanding and respect. I know there was a little handout that most of you picked up, but also you can go on the Ministry of um, BC's website and find out all kinds of information. I gave you just this little snippet here. What this is, is you're looking at the school districts in BC that have um, agreements. So they have spent the time to collaborate with the communities and put together their enhancement agreements addressing things like sense of belonging and mastery in, in academic areas and improving the governance of who is doing the materials and, and creating these opportunities within the schools. There's over 60 school districts that are identified here that either have an enhancement agreement in place or already have their second or moving on to their third. So that's already, you know, school districts that have been working for 10 years to focus on this area. Vancouver, just looking at some of the local ones, Vancouver and Surrey, for the most part, were in the first stages of, you know, their first five years, on to the edge of ready to look at the next five years. Um, so the enhancement agreements, again, the main focus of these, the goal areas, are looking at how do you increase, uh, increase Aboriginal students' sense of belonging, place, and self-esteem? How do you increase their acceptance and caring that they're receiving in the schools? How do you increase the awareness and appreciation of Aboriginal students, histories, traditions, cultural contributions for all students and by all students? Strengthening community relationships and connections. Measuring the success as a holistic, you know, encompassing both academic, the mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. How do we do that? And we think about what does this have to do with the library and the books, right? We know when students are feeling connected, if they feel like they belong in a place, and it's the same for an adult. If you walk in a room and you get that sense that everybody's looking at you as judging you and saying that you really don't belong here, you hesitate, you pull back, and you may not speak up. Or an emotion might arise from you to say, darn it all, I have, this is my place and I'm going to speak up. So there might be that anger that comes forward. Whether you're a small child or an adult, it's the exact same thing. Connectedness in all kinds of research, and I pulled one little piece, and as researchers you can find tons of research that said if you feel connected and you feel like you belong somewhere, you're more apt to be involved. And this little chart on the side here, I'll put a little bit bigger, there's some strategies and ways to, to uh, increase school connectedness, but I wanted to look at, you know, specifically, you know, when students feel, and this is the same for the teachers that you're working with and the, the colleagues alongside of you in, in universities and even in general life, if you have adult support, if you have people around you that are supporting you in your interests, um, in, in the way you're developing and your questions, you feel like you belong to a peer group, you have people that you can share ideas with and understand what you're talking about, 
If you feel, com you know, you have a commitment to education, somebody in the room believes that you have the ability to do something, to achieve, have something to contribute to the conversation. If you feel like your school environment represents you as an individual, walk into a school when the posters are up on the wall, who's in those pictures? What are the symbols that are on the wall? Do you see you know, something that resembles you, your family, your connection, your history, your culture? Well, we know this and through research that if these type of things are in schools, in community environments, in the university, there's school connectedness. These people feel connected. And when we feel connected, you have positive, you have a more increased uh, level of positive educational outcomes and a positive healthy choices, healthy outcomes. So I put that in there for a reason. So when we talk about accessing Aboriginal teaching and learning resources, how do we get the right resources or the appropriate resources? Maybe right isn't the right word, but the appropriate resources into the classroom libraries, uh, the, cl the libraries and the classrooms. One way that many school districts are trying to address, you know, selection and purchase of materials, and many of you would already know this, is through the Educational Resource um, Acquisition Consortium. So, I mean, they have a, a small team of people that look at the materials. So somebody might say, oh, I'm kind of curious about this book, and they might go through a review of it. Is it a good book? Does it meet, you know, basic standards? Uh, that they have set up in evaluating, does it meet licensing practices? Is it something that um, maybe needs to be flagged with a concern or a warning? So they have a system, and you can go again, I put this online, and again, I'm, I'm sure most of you would have uh, this knowledge already, but just it is a way for somebody to make a, what type of resources are there, and is there a concern about this book I'm just about ready to buy? And again, just a little bit more information, and I'm not actually going to read this slide, but all of those pieces, it sort of breaks down. This is what they're looking at, understanding social um, considerations when you're selecting, purchasing, uh, whether it be a book or a media or a tape or a video. Um, there's very specific things that they're asking. So when I looked at this and I thought, okay, still this falls into the hands of just a small group of people, and it usually is something that I can go online, but what happens when I have a classroom of teachers and I'm creating a professional development opportunity? Or as a teacher myself, I have students that are in my room and a book falls into their hand that I kind of go, hmm, maybe this isn't the best selection or maybe this is a fabulous book. And do I just, as a teacher, just share this? Yes, that's a good book to use. Or do I bring my collection and this is what you're going to use? Or you can use the library. I have to empower them and how did they make those selections? How do I give them the ability to have those conversations, to, to look at the materials. And if you go back to the reason I started with the enhancement agreement, as a, you know, the Ministry of Education is saying all people in BC, if they're coming through our systems as young learners coming into our universities, all people should have a greater understanding of authentic histories, culture, language. And if we do that through books, we've got to make sure, or video, media, we need to make sure that it's appropriate. And we also have to empower people to, how do you ask those questions? What is an appropriate book? How do I ask those questions? So this particular tool, and I know I've printed off copies, this is something that I found really valuable as an easy way to get it into the hands of teachers, librarians, students, to say, okay, break it up in a, in a, you know, a section and say, let's look at this particular book. Let's ask some of the questions. This um, resource is, again, from the Western and Northern uh, Canadian Protocol for Collaboration in Basic Education. It's a tool. It's a common tool so that you have uh, frameworks within it that you can ask questions. It's created in partnership with, you know, Aboriginal people, educators, ministry, uh, so that it, it, it has some, some meat to it when you're, you're saying, why use this tool? The purpose, again, is looking at some of the teaching and learning resources and making sure that they are culturally authentic, historically accurate, respectful and of the diversity of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. It's identity and experience. And I apologize, all my slides do not have the santé gu on Métis. It, I could not get my apple to respond. So I tried. I was ready to go in there with a pencil, but um, couldn't do it. So, all right, so what does this tool do? We're going to look at you know, ways to encourage students and educators to recognize the importance of what the elders are saying and our knowledge keepers, recognizing that the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit uh, educators 
provide enriched materials. There's a, there's a vast knowledge that they're going to provide for us that also that we value and support Métis, uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit languages and cultures, that they're accurately uh, representative, that they're reflected, the languages, and we affirm and support the engagement of our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit parents, caregivers, communities, as traditional teachers, and this is important. So again, it breaks down in uh, four different sections within the framework, and again, we talk about resource, um, procedures, language and imagery, uh, indigenous knowledge, worldview, and the historical and contemporary portrayal. So this is one page, and we looked at language and imagery. This is one section. You can see as, you know, if you, had a, if you decided you wanted to do something with a, a group of teachers or fellow librarians as a professional development, and you selected, I know you have brought amazing books, and I love all the books on the table, but let's say we just select a few of those books, and you go through these questions about, does it portray First Nations, Métis, Inuits, you know, speech and dialect in an appropriate and respectful way? So as you're asking those questions, if you're looking, if you're thinking about people that perhaps haven't had a great uh, amount of experience in this area, don't have a real great resource to tap into, this is a way to look at the materials that are out there and really start to ask those questions. What makes an appropriate selection? So if we go through those questions, and it also helps as we're going through the questions, what I've watched with students is that if you're asking these questions, they're, ch they're checking sort of some of their judgments that they've walked in with. They're thinking about what else do I need to think about when I'm you know, saying something or watching you know, Bugs Bunny. Good heavens to Betsy if you've watched some of the old Bugs Bunny. <laughs> There's some pieces on there that should not be on there. Um, so again, I gave you just a couple of uh, samples of how you might be able to do that. And again, even this is in the document. You could create this as an assignment for students coming into the libraries. It's an easy thing, and it, it provides some feedback for you. This particular book, I'm not going to say whether it's a good book or a bad book. It's one that I'd carry around to go, hmm, interesting. It's in our libraries. It's in our libraries. It's in our resource centers. It's something that's relatively new. But when I look at it, I think, okay, is this a book that I should just have on the library shelf? Because I think there are differences between, you know, a child going into a library and picking something out for free reading and a book that I'm going to use as a guided reading material, a book that I'm going to say, this needs some critical thinking. This needs some work with it. This particular book talks about... Um, Hmm, they don't say half-breeds, but they say, you know, savages. They refer to um, the First Nations group as not being purebred. Um, they refer to as the reservations, you know, the, the group, the First Nations going off to the reservations is a very good idea. And there's smiling faces, and there's a mixture between fiction and authentic truth. Like the, you've, so as a child reading this, would they have the ability to decipher what was truth What's, it's presented as a historical piece. What's truth, what's not? Is it okay to call somebody a savage? Is it all right to say half-breed or not purebred? Are these things are okay? These are in our libraries. And this, if you use this type of a tool with this kind of a book, it offers the ability to have that very difficult conversation instead of just saying, well, maybe we shouldn't use this book. Because I don't want to you know, ban any book from the library, but I think books have the, the ability to be used as critical thinking materials to say, okay, what, what can this book offer me in, in my guided discussion? So when you think about, okay, making the connections, when you can offer the ability to teachers or librarians and students, and you put those tools together, you put the skills together, so you put the idea and the vision of the enhancement agreement together with you know, a guided piece of material like this, which is, gives you the skills and the tools and how to make selections, and you work with, uh, whether it's teachers or students, and you collaborate, you can come up with just amazing resources. And I, I put in, now this, I would have failed if I ever put a slide like this in, in my, my, you know, if I was doing my master's. I did this just so that you could identify um, the material later. This is online. It's this 97-page uh, document, and I'll let you have a look through it. And why I wanted to show this, it's a teacher that when I was a district principal for Aboriginal education, one of my resource teachers said, you know what, we need to create more opportunities to have good you know, materials in the library. So she took the idea 
of this toolkit. She took the toolkit, oops, wrong document. She took the toolkit and said, okay, how do I use the materials in here to guide that discussion and work with teachers? And she started to go off to say, okay, what, what makes a good book? And she created this document following some of the questions in here, plus looking at social responsibility is still hot in, in the schools. That's a piece that teachers, I try to use things that teachers can understand. So social responsibility, that matrix is still out there, social emotional learning. So we put this in here, and we also talked about the rubrics, or the rating. This is Erin. Erin William developed this, and I, you know, I give all full credit to it, because she's, she said, okay, this is my rating. Whether the book is a good, a good book, I thought this was my time. It's like, quick, stop talking. <laughs> the, um, uh, have the, you know, her rating as, is it a book she would use? Is it something that should come with a guided lesson? Is it something that hmm, might be questionable and you want to really consider putting it on the shelf? Um, and she went through and she created 97 pages of books that she's graded. And again, for what would be a good use, she's noted uh, the publisher. She's noted, you know, sort of key themes in the books. She's noted the nations of where the First Nations and Métis Inuit people are coming from. She's put, um, you'll see on the top of the chart, there's an M, a B, and a CC. Within Vancouver, our enhancement agreement has three goal areas, belonging, uh, mastery, and sense, uh, uh, culture and community. So she went through these books as well and said, okay, if I use this in a classroom, it identifies goals with belonging. Because you're always trying to find ways of, if I'm going to get somebody to use the book, they need to understand why it's a good book. So it matches in a variety of ways. So advice for librarians and educators out there. Visit the Weewa Library. You've got, we've got Sarah in the room today. You've got amazing resources there um, to, to help you understand what makes a, you know, a great choice when you're looking at some of the materials. Where are some of the great sites to go and start exploring? Who are some of your key people in the communities? Um, looking at UBC Faculty of Education, there's amazing experts there. Their library is fantastic. Go out and visit the public schools. I know many of you are either in schools or public schools. Go and visit them and talk about what, help, you know, what selections they have, why they make their selections, whether they're feeling it's you know, serving the purpose or not. And then sometimes challenge the schools that don't have a lot of Aboriginal students why they don't have books. Because again, these books are not just for Aboriginal students. They're for all students. They're for everybody. And look at, you know, I gave you, there's a little um, bookmark. Hopefully some of you picked it up. Indigenous foundations for your own personal professional development. If you don't have a good sense of understanding of authentic histories of Canada and some of the uh, contemporary, you know, pieces of work that are happening now through research, the Indigenous foundations is an excellent way to tap into just so when you get some moment of free time, to learn about what's the 60 scoop, learn about what the residential school experience was about, learn about you know, the, the effects of, um, you know, with, with the, the Indian Act and the treaties, and why these are important. Why do we need to know these? And when you're critical in the sense of asking your students and your parents, they've got a lot of knowledge. And again, things to remember, I think one of the key things as an educator that I learned at a very early age, be humble. Be humble and ask for guidance. Don't assume that you need to know everything, because sometimes that's what we feel like our jobs are. We have to be the leaders, and we, it's a problem if we need to ask. Be humble and ask students. Learn together. Listen and engage in dialogue. Work together, again, with students and staff in your community when there's a concern. Um, now, I guess one of the key things, I know there's policies and procedures and rules about how to select a book and how to get a book out of the library when it's maybe deemed and not a great book and there's usually you know a number of questions and pages where you have to say this book isn't good because of this that and the other thing sometimes that's pretty daunting and especially when you're dealing with community members that might be either challenged with language or coming from a marginalized situation to all of a sudden present them with a policy that they have to fill out you know four pages of why this book has caused them some you know hurt or concern that might not be the right approach so maybe the approach is saying, you know what, let's look at this book together and go back to a toolkit like I gave you and start to explore and help them understand, help them have the ability to express to you what is the problem or what is the challenge with this particular material and help you understand their perspective. So what do we do? It all starts with a conversation. And that's where I'm going to end because I really think that's, that's the piece about picking books, to start talking to people.
All right. So thank you. Let's go. I sort of viewed myself as the show and tell portion of this colloquia. But before I start showing and telling, have you specific questions that you'd really like to talk about? Because I think that's a very good thing to do to start the conversation about indigenous materials. No, it's late in the day. Have more coffee? Cookies? All right. We'll have questions after All right. Some of, the, some of you have been students in SLACE and have taken the course that we offer at the iSchool on First Nations literature. And I really view it as an opportunity to appreciate the brilliance that exists and the materials and the resources that are out there and I think uh, shamelessly ignored in our library collections. I think you should start doing surveys as you start finding materials and finding out how many libraries actually have these materials in their library collections, whether it be a school, whether it be a public library. And I really think it's up to us to advocate to have those resources there. I think what Deborah said was really important. This is not just for Aboriginal children. This is for all of our children. And if they don't see the resources that reflect children in their neighborhoods, that children in their communities, then I think it marginalizes them um, to the same way that if you exclude any cultural group that is in your neighborhood. But they certainly are part of our fabric. They're part of our history. And so for that reason alone, we have to have access, first of all and foremost. And I'm amazed at how Often, I was just searching for resources just to sort of bring along with me today that I could really find limited access, even in public libraries who have a real mandate to provide excellent quality collections for children. Um, so access, I think, is one of our biggest issues. Can we find these resources? And I think finding out about the resources is probably one of our hardest tasks. There are lots of lists. There are lots of opportunities. There are, there's lots of expertise out there. We have to be aggressive about finding it, perusing it. We have to educate ourselves so that we know how to access it and how to find it. Because if we don't do it, it's not going to land on our plates kind of magically. If your library collections are outsourced, believe me, they're probably not going to be searching for all the small presses that have truly wonderful publications for your libraries. They're not going to be assertively going after that one-off title that was produced uh, by a tiny little press in the Yukon. They're not going to be uh, making sure that there's retrospective acquisition of titles that are just solid books that should always be there in every single collection all the way along the way. When you talk um, the resources being available, one of the things that puzzled me most was when I got a censorship request to remove a book from our library collection of one of the best children's books ever published. And a lot of you will know Nicola Campbell, and you'll know Shinchi's Canoe and Shishietko, and now there's a new Grandpa's Girl. Some of the finest books written local writer, this is our history, this is our community. But this parent wanted this book removed from our public library because it was too disturbing for his child to find out about. He did not want to engage in a conversation about residential school. He did not want his child to find out about this part of our history. And he felt that he was protecting his child by having that book removed from our collection. So I think we have to aggressively protect these materials in our library resources as well. And if it's just too easy to hide a book or to remove it from a shelf, we might not just be getting rid of uh, titles that are suspicious. We might be doing a huge disservice by removing the books that ask big questions that make us analyze our ways of thinking and our attitudes about parts of our history. 
um, because it's too hard to talk about. In the public library, unfortunately, we don't get to engage in those one-on-one -on -one discussions often with children in the same way that you could in a classroom. You could talk about these books. You could give it a context. You could talk about the history. You could give multiple perspectives on residential school, for example. There are a myriad of brilliant titles that talk about this at a number of different age levels or appropriateness. This is one of the gentlest and most perfect introductions to residential school that you're going to find. So to have this book removed from my shelf was it, or the threat of it was an absolute travesty. So not only do we have to be aggressive about seeking out these resources, we have to be assertive about protecting them. Um, there, uh, I think, are a lot of resources that help us make those decisions and help us defend those positions. And when I had to aggressively defend that title in my collection, I went after all of them so that I could point out how lauded this book, how beautifully reviewed this book was, how many awards it had won, um, that it demanded a place in every single library collection and not just in ours. In our course, we talk about a number of reviewing sources because I do like to go to those individuals who are speaking from the culture and who are addressing uh, questions of appropriation and questions of authenticity and questions of stereotype. And in the United States, Oyate, how do you pronounce that? Okay. Is a fabulous online resource and sort of an adjunct to this resource, The Broken Flute. And this is a book we often refer to in class when we're in doubt as to perhaps what um, a cultural perspective on a specific title would be. Um, what we don't have in Canada is sort of a similar resource. And unfortunately, the state of reviewing in Canada is really suspect. Are we really finding out about all of these titles? Um, we're sort of reduced to CM Online, which is the best of the best resource, review resource in Canada. And you'd have to check it every single week and aggressively look through those for titles of a First Nations that have First Nations contact. Um, or you're, you're again going out and you're searching Fetus Press websites or um, all of the small presses that actually specialize in indigenous um, works. And you have to know those websites. You have to know those publishers. You, you really do have to be a fabulous researcher. These books are not going to fall into your laps. I think our libraries are easily populated with the big American uh, sellers, uh, bestsellers and the titles that are reviewed in the standard reviewing journals, but you're not going to see a lot of these titles if you're just looking at the standard review sources. So consulting lists, recommended lists, going through websites. Um, in Canada, they've done a, a First Nations Community Reads project, which I think is a highly laudable uh, project out of Ontario. And it's been done for many years in a row. It highlights First Nations uh, titles that are highly recommended. And it gets everybody to read them. And I wish that we sort of had a provincial First Nations community read. Some people read that, though, as only First Nations people should read these books. And I think everybody should read these books. This is our history. These are our communities. So this is this year's First Nations community reads title. Shannon and the Dream for a School, a nonfiction title, beautifully written. And I was on the Red Cedar Nonfiction uh, Selection Committee this year, and I really wanted this book to be there so that it would roll out to any of the community public libraries or school libraries that were participating in the Red Cedar Book Awards. So once again, it would be highlighted to all of our communities, available to all of our communities, and to all of our children. So it's a wonderful nonfiction title, for those of you who haven't read it, about a young activist who fights and struggles to get a new school built in her community. Um, it's very passionate. It's um, 
it's dramatic, and at the end, it's um, heartbreaking. That's the perfect word for it. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, she's killed in a car accident before she can see this wish fulfilled, which it was shortly after the publication of the book. It makes us aware of our cultural heroes and our activists. I mean, a lot of people haven't heard about Tom, Tom Longboat, an Olympic runner. And we have books that, that celebrate First Nations heroes in our community. There's a whole series of books about First Nations leaders. And I think we should know about them as well as we know about all of our other heroic individuals and sports heroes and uh, educational leaders and political leaders that are here in Canada. And yet, again, I wonder if enough children have access to the books that tell them that. A lot of books um, have come from very small presses. And I think Thetis Press, if you know no other uh, publisher, is the one that you absolutely have to check out on a very regular basis to see what they're publishing and who they're publishing. Um, little tiny books like this. This is one of my absolute favorites in all the sort of grouping here today. Zoe and the Fawn, it's a very unassuming little paperback picture book. It's not, it's not enormous, but this is, sort of, this is sort of our brown bear, brown bear, you know, um, in a Canadian disguise, illustrated by Julie Flett. So it's a very unassuming little title, but I think it beautifully brings in cultural mores and um, ways of being very in a very easygoing kind of a way. You feel at peace when you finish reading this book. It's just so calm and unassuming and beautifully done. One of the things that I'm so ex absolutely thrilled to see come out, and again, I think Thetis Press is leading the way, is uh, our titles that retain the linguistic component by virtue of a CD. Stats Canada is coming out with all kinds of new statistics and just on the drive here today on the news they had a piece about the fact that um, only one quarter of 20 or, or, or young people under 20 years of age can speak their own language or in their indigenous language if they're First Nations and that so many indigenous languages um, are at risk. So here's an opportunity to not only capture the language, even just listening to it is a brilliant experience. But to have this is invaluable. And now there are several books in this series. And the books that are not only bilingual in text, and there's more and more of them coming out, um, allow a reader, any reader, to sort of see a new way of expressing. It's, a, it's sort of like any bilingual book. It gives validation to another language, but to be able to hear it as well is just um, a totally enlightening event, I think, to some children to be able to understand that there's a totally different way of expressing language and expressing story. And this captures cultural information that otherwise would be gone, I think. I was always wishing that Thompson Highway's brilliant uh, trilogy, um, I heard him tell the story in Cree at a Word on the Street event. Why weren't those books packaged with a CD capturing that bilingual presentation? Because again, it adds a level of depth and richness that otherwise we would never probably be able to experience. The new media that's coming out, and you mentioned a uh, a uh, comic book, and there, I mean, there's stunning graphic novels like Red, a Haida Manga, and Tricksters, but also the field of animation. Um, I don't know what you think about these resources, but I adore them. This is a whole series called Raven Tales, and I think these are probably, these were the most borrowed items of a First Nations. Uh, with First Nations content in my public library strictly because they're on DVD and people were borrowing DVDs like crazy. So if these were sitting on the shelf, 
out the door they flew. But I could put up a display of books and nothing would go out except the DVDs. So if this is their entree, I'm really pleased because maybe they'll go back and they'll look for First Nations folk tales or, or lore or mythologies and read them. And this one is Raven Stole the Sun, and it's very heavily placed. In fact, you can hear the language of Bill Reed's uh, original book called Raven Steals the Light in the retelling that they actually use online. So new media is allowing a whole new generation of children to sort of um, experience and hear stories that otherwise they might not be inspired to take out or inspired to view or use. There's so many books here, and since I mentioned read a hi to manga, um, I, probably all of you are in mourning of the news that Douglas and McIntyre uh, may be going into receivership, and that includes Greystone Books, the publishers of this little hummingbird. And so when major publishers like Douglas and McIntyre are facing that kind of a threat in the Canadian publishing industry, it makes it very, very hard for smaller presses to survive unless we're absolutely supporting them. And if we're not buying their resources, how do they survive? So if Douglas and McIntyre and Greystone are having difficulty in the Canadian arena with their history, with their brilliance, with their excellence, with their huge publishing lines, how will smaller presses that are bringing regional books to the fore possibly survive if public libraries and school libraries are not investing in them? So not only is it a commitment to Canadian literature, but it's a Canadian, it's regional literatures and small presses. And that's why I worry about the state of reviewing, the state of, of people accessing and finding out about these resources and making sure that they're committed to um, having the best of them available in the classrooms and in the public libraries. How am I doing for time? Okay. If you've never heard him speak, and I know he's spoken here a couple of times at the Ike Barber, um, there are two YouTube videos, one on The Little Hummingbird and one on Red A Hide a Manga on YouTube. Just, um, if you could pronounce his name. Shannon, you can. I can't pronounce the name. I kept listening to the videos to try to find Hit himself. But anyways, just Google on, on YouTube, The Little Hummingbird. And he is a delight. He'll sort of break every, every construct you've ever had about uh, indigenous materials. He's just a, a, a fabulous speaker. And he speaks with such passion and such clarity. But one of the statements that I absolutely adore um, is on the YouTube video about the little hummingbird. And he says this is actually based on a legend that comes from Ecuador and Peru. And he says, I ripped it off from them. I learned appropriation from the best, he says. So he sort of challenges every, uh, every idea that you've got about cultural appropriation and authenticity and... Of course, he uh, grew up on Haida Gwaii. He's a great-grandson of one of the Eden Shaws. So his, his history is well embedded, but he doesn't even look First Nations. He sort of challenges your perceptions of who is and who's not um, First Nations even right from the get-go. And that sort of brings around the question of who gets to write these stories and, and whose perspective is being told. And um, there's so many people who have been writing and who, um, who speak to that issue. And so many of them, like Thomas King, Bruhak, um, have, I think, um, from their blended ancestries, a different perspective on presenting information to everybody so that everybody can appreciate it and everybody can enjoy it. And I think one of those mediators is Sylvia Olson, who's not First Nations, but married into a Coast Salish family and lived on the Sarslip Reserve. 
and is bringing local history again, history set right here on Vancouver Island, to every child in sort of in Canada, but definitely hopefully in British Columbia so that they're very, very aware of it. So a lot of you know these names. A lot of you know uh, Wabusi and Leo Yurksa and Nicola Campbell and Michael Arvarla Kusigak um, and Richard Van Camp. And these are names that need to roll off our tongues every time we're looking at a curriculum unit or any time we're doing a display. We need to just make them seamlessly part of what we're doing every single day, part of every book list, part of every promotion, part of every um, event that we might you know, sort of attend or talk about books or any chance that we have to promote them. I think we need to take the opportunity to make sure they're embedded in every way and in everything that we do. Should I stop there? How can I bring in some experts, bring in some community members, bring in some from the local high school or students, and have a learning opportunity? You're not censoring books. It's not what I'm about. It's about, okay, if there's a book, I used one. I'm not going to censor that book. There's, it's an interesting book, and if it gets students to read because it's, at a, it's an interesting, using a comic type of thing, that's great. But if it needs some guidance in how you use it and how you learn from the book, then that's what you need to do. So that's how I would do it. I, I might even create a, you know, a community parent night just to talk about books. How do we select books for our families? You know, when you look at Shishi Ekbo, um, even that book, if a family has concern, okay, maybe you don't want to talk about the residential school, but how many children have dealt with separation, going to a hospital overnight? There's a way to bring that conversation in. It doesn't talk in a negative way about abuse and violence. It talks about separation, having to leave family. That's a beautiful way to talk about stepping away from family, stepping away from what you're comfortable with. We have books about death in our libraries. It's, there's a place for these, but it's to get people to understand how to use and how to understand how it's not a scary thing. 
So that's what I would do. I mean, well, we're well protected in the public library system. Freedom to read means that we still have Little House on the Prairie on our bookshelves. And if we were going to withdraw anything, it might be Little House on the Prairie for its uh, incorrect historical, cultural portrayals. So, or the Indian in the Cupboard, which of course has a long standing uh, history of, of uh, controversy. But it comes down to almost every book that you could name. So we either stand up for Shinchi and Shishietko in our collection, it means we also stand up for Little House on the Prairie and the Indian in the Cupboard. And we hope that they are having those dialogues. We hope that they are having those discussions. We hope that they're putting those books in context. And if we can facilitate that and have that happen, if only we had them in a, a captured audience like a classroom, that would be ideal so that you could actually explore that. But it does mean defending books that may not have uh, the kind of portrayal that you would be pleased with either. And that brings across, the course, the question of selection as censorship. Which books are you not replacing or which books are you not putting in your collection? So I think um, we should open it up to the audience now and perhaps we can do it with the, the whole system here so that we're able to capture the questions. Are there any questions out there who would like to begin? We need more coffee. <laughs> so actually, Deb, you already began this, um, in, in, but I would perhaps you could say a bit more in terms of um, in your presentation earlier, you were talking about beginning a conversation, but how sometimes people might feel as though they are not well positioned to begin that conversation because they're becoming aware of perhaps the, the histories that they were taught in school had some gaps, shall we say, um, some misrepresentations. And if you have some tips or suggestions on how to begin, you, you mentioned the Indigenous Foundation, but perhaps something along the lines of who to start a conversation with. Um, and again, it depends on who, who I'm having the conversation with, I guess. Like if, if you're looking at for professionals, whether it's a group of teachers or librarians, um, looking at seeking out UBC connections. There are a lot of people pending again. There isn't the one go-to person, right? There isn't the one answer. There isn't the one website. But if it's something like you're going, all right, I don't really have a real sense of the residential school experience. And a lot of people call it the residential school experiment because truly that's what it was. And as we talk about what does that mean? Why are we still talking about it? And people are, a lot of times will say, well, this happened so long ago, but did it? You know, the last school closed, was it 1994, I believe? 94, Mission, 96? Some debates on some of the, the final dates of the doors that closed, but it's not so long ago. You know, and the, the you know, like it's the parents of people my age <laughs> that have experienced this. So when you think of why do we need to know these things? Why should Shishi Echo's book, you know, be there in the library? Conversation, I guess, is as for your personal level of understanding. How comfortable do you feel with your level of understanding of the authentic history, the histories, the contemporary issues, what the Indian Act means, whether the Indian Act actually works with, you know, the, the Freedom Act. You know, so if, if they're, I'm getting kind of my words jumbled up here, but it's the, how, if you think of the Indian Act, how many people understand the Indian Act? How many people understand the 60 scoop? What are these things? So for your personal understanding, Indigenous Foundations is an easy place to go. If you look at, again, Wewa Library, any topic that you even have an inkling of going, I heard this, but I don't know, I, how do I dig it a little deeper? They're amazing. They're gonna be able to help hook you into either a really heavy you know, piece of material or something to introduce you to the conversation. And if you're thinking about how do you create these conversations at the same time that you're looking at other people, whether it's a group of your friends, book clubs. Book clubs are interesting because then you can actually have a discussion about 
what might, you know, not, what you went through the K-12 system, I'm sure most of you in Canada, for the most part, most of you were not taught a good percentage of Canadian history. So what a great place to start, just talk about it to each other. And again, there's all kinds of spots. So depending on the question and who you're going to ask and how you get to it, I guess that's what it's, it's a difficult one to answer. But I guess going back to that, be humble, just start. Ha. Uh, okay, I'm going to start over here. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, we totally agree that a conversation needs to be started. In many schools um, across the province, that conversation needs to be started in French. And that's, in particular, you know, we already see the dearth, you know, with regarding English language resources that discuss our indigenous cultures. But we also need to have this conversation in French. And I don't know, I'm the teacher librarian in a secondary school that has an immersion track, and I'm here with one of my colleagues who teaches grade 8 and grade 9 socials in French. And we will use English language resources because we have to, but what about sharing our history and culture in French, which is one of our official languages? I don't know what to say. <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of resources, obviously, in English, but there are resources in French. And again, just tapping into, I don't know if you're in Vancouver. Yes. Okay, if you, Vancouver uh, School District has a consultant. Correct. Uh, so at that level, there are a number of resources that he has access to, because I know I bought them. <laughs> so that there are materials. So what I would suggest is a start with what you have, and if you can identify a need, then there are places all across Canada that might have books that aren't specific to the way we are used to teaching the assignment, but how you can use a piece of material, whether it's at a research level or through a video, that you can get at the understanding of what, what it is that you need. Because I think sometimes, again, as a teacher, I'm very used to having this is my curriculum, this is the resource, it plugs in very nicely and away I go. And you have to start thinking differently because that curriculum is based and driven by a conversation that did not include the Indigenous voice in stories and history, right? So we have to find a way to shift it ever so slightly and find the materials that are out there and create that conversation. So if you think of, if I just look at the Shannon's dream, you know, that one's interesting because when you talk about social justice issues, why not start with that one? Rather than a lot of times we just bring up indigenous materials when we're talking about Aboriginal issues, right? So social studies is an area where obviously there's a lot of historical pieces, but I would tap into it. Manitoba, there's a lot of French schools, you know, it's the same Boniface, the area that Métis culture is very strong. So there's a piece of history there that I know there are materials there. But you just reach out to those other school districts. That's, that's what I would have to do. And it's one of those things that the resources are challenging because there's been years that no one was buying them and putting them. And as you were saying, the, these publishers are dying out because people aren't buying the books. But I think that as an individual, as a teacher, get out there and just really seek a little bit further than what we're comfortable with and reach out to the colleagues, because I, I, I know that there are materials in Manitoba. You know? so, yeah. yeah. So, and, and if, if you can identify something, yeah. then you can bring it to the libraries or bring it to the social studies department and start demanding why we need to have it there, right? I guess this is a comment mostly for public libraries and for Allison and I and others to just chat about. And, and that is uh, public libraries do have the difficulty of not having a group of children to discuss with unless it's one of our book clubs. Um, but we do have opportunities to talk to collectives of adults. So uh, children's librarians need the chutzpah in education to make decisions about whether during Canadian Children's Book Week, which is in June, or is it in May, is changed. Um, to have a, a special one hour or two hours discussion uh, to invite um, the population of adults and invite people through the school 
where you make a friendly presentation on Canadian children's books and highlight Aboriginal and discuss the issues. And then you have a display and you have handouts and bibliographies. And when parents are engaged, they will walk off with the titles. And that means the issues as well as the titles. And when I was a working librarian, and I know you've done it too, I've had six hours of six evenings, Shannon, at the West Vancouver Library, the Vancouver Public Library of children's literature courses, free for adults, and writers came, and um, parents. And it was only a children's librarian talking with them. And they took hundreds of books, and they became ravenous, and all the way through oh, for reading with their kids. And that's the way you get to the kids, is always through the adults in large numbers. That's one way. And uh, what was interesting is that through every one of those hours, it was possible to work at a grassroots level of presenting issues and concerns, such as censorship, such as freedom to read, such as the um, excluded, the great excluded from children's literature and how that was changing. Um, there are PACs in schools looking for speakers, and we have both spoken hundreds of times to them about children's books. There are, and media, and there are parent participation preschools that have an educational component, and once a month they have to have a speaker. So along with every other group that asks us to speak, uh, it's just the youth services, children's librarians have to have um, enough energy inside them. And of course, we always feel overworked, because we are, to reach out and say, I am available for this. I would like to share my knowledge with you. And although we are not teachers, we are children's media experts, the specialists in a community. So to make that known is really important. And to put Aboriginal children's media on the center focus of everything we speak on um, as part of it, as integrated within it, seems really critical and important to me. What do you think, Alison? <laughs> I mean, we do have so many opportunities to also work with teachers and commit to uh, working with teacher librarians. We've sat on subcommittees many, many times. We share uh, opportunities for committees like Red Cedar. We uh, often are asked to present uh, professional days. All of those are opportunities for us to headline the most important titles that we can think of and to promote them in the same way that we promote everything else. We just have to be inclusive and be consciously inclusive all the time. idea of, you know, trying to get to parents through the children. Because if you use the idea of having a reading night so all the kids can pick out their favorite book and invite their parents to listen, it's fabulous because all the parents will bring not only themselves, their you know, grandparents, the neighbor, to hear their child stand up and read either a portion of their favorite book and say why it's, it's great and why they would recommend it to someone else. It's another way to get, you know, that information out there, but also the, your connection then with the parents in the community to follow it up with another evening to talk about different things. But, yeah. Um, Vancouver had a fab, Vancouver Public Library had a fabulous program, the Storyteller in Residence, mm -hmm. in which they were having First Nations storytellers. It's a very public arena. It's a fabulous opportunity to, for people to hear stories that they perhaps had no access to before. Um, events like that. We just had culture days celebrated all the way across the country. I know our library had a focus on First Nations and they were doing murals and they had a storyteller and they also had, you know, displays of resources from the community. So once, uh, once again, it was a perfect opportunity to engage in the community and make connections. So Alison Campbell spearheaded that at North End District Library and it was, it was fabulous in the way that it could sort of bring things to the community attention uh, through collaboration. I guess my question's kind of 
related in that sometimes we work with communities and ask them what they'd like to see and what they'd like to see we're unable to purchase. Um, you know, sort of, you know, I would like to see books for children under two that focus on my particular First Nation in this community of Vancouver. Or, and, and sometimes the book doesn't exist, so I'm, I'm curious, and I know there was some work around books for BC babies and doing translations in very particular local languages, um, sort of on a very small scale, and I'm curious about other uh, other uses in libraries or in, in schools where there's actually collaborative content creation as a way to build resources? Good question. Um, when I was on the Books for BC Babies Committee was the year that we had Richard Van Camp create a board book for babies because we searched high and low and we couldn't find one that satisfied you know, what we wanted to present to every single baby born in the entire province. And so it was through uh, contact on the committee who talked to Richard and he said, oh yes, I have a lullaby. If you know Richard, you know he always has a book for any purpose. And he did, he created this. We got back to him and he said, can we, can we flesh this out a bit more? He did. We approached a publisher who had never created a board book before. They did. And we had Welcome Song for Baby, you know, a truly important board book for us from an Aboriginal writer. Um, that we could then present and roll out. Now, if we hadn't had that opportunity, um, we would have had to go with either something from the United States. We did find a couple of other titles that we maybe could have created. But I don't know, in the last four years, we've seen a whole little blossoming of Aboriginal board books for babies. Was this not considered by the publishers to be something that was, that was viable? But all of a sudden, now Richard has a second one. There's a whole line of using First Nations artwork to create concept books like ABCs and counting and everything else like that. But again, working with the publishing community gives us an opportunity to do something that didn't exist before. Now, I think what you might be referring to is Lilouat, who they did brilliant. And this breaks copy. I mean, we're not supposed to interfere with the books that we have in our libraries, but they did overlays, plastic overlays in their language in the board books or the books that they wanted to see the, so that could preserve the language. Um, we would probably view that as mutilation in the public library, but it, it, it met their needs. That's what they wanted and that's what fulfilled what they needed to do to sort of keep their language alive. So there's very creative ways of, of, of being able to do that and to answer specific needs when they don't exist otherwise because a lot of the resources, we're seeing five languages represented perhaps in the, um, the CDs that are being, you know, there might be one dog rib, one, you know, a couple of Cree. Um, we're not seeing the, the breadth of language resource that's out there, but others are answering it by doing their own recordings, you know, and having that within uh, the community so that people can have access. So I think we have to get pretty creative. I think the digital media is going to allow this to a far greater extent than the publishing media will ever be able to answer this, I think. Can I, I'm just going to add to that. I just, you know, just do a shameless plug in some sense, but um, kind of stems on what you were saying with the idea of when there is a resource that you're looking for that doesn't exist, those little alphabet number books that are from Native Reflection, that was me. That I went and I said, oh, it's you. I know. And you did that. And <laughs> do I get any royalties? No. <laughs> but it's one of the, I knew the gentleman, I knew the artwork and the things that he was doing, and I said, you know, here's a market for you. And I, stupid me, I could be retired. But no, I said, literally, I said, this is a market. I've worked in the school districts, I've worked in elementary and secondary. They're, there, there are, these books do not exist, and how can we make it happen? And if you know his work, uh, he had a collection of artists, because he you knows the t-shirts and the, the mugs and all of these things. I said, you've got the artists already. You've, you have all of these pieces pretty well already, so why can't we use some of these images for books? And it was just literally sitting, him and I sitting there having coffee, and I hand sketched just some, uh, we should have books, and you should have number books, and you should have this, and you should have pencils, and you should have, because I've been a teacher for a zillion years, and you should have, you know, and off he went with this idea, and he went to his artists, and he said, we need the ABC books, we need the number books. And what I like about him is he also, in the back of the book, 
identifies all the artists and their nations. What a great way to have a conversation. You know, and again, there it is on a picture book. Those picture books, you can use that in grade 12. You know, it's a great, you know, a little one for a tiny tot, but the artwork is brilliant in those books. So you bring them into a grade 12, and you can look at the artistry. What's the difference between a Cree artist and looking at a West Coast artist with this beautiful little book? And get them to think about the art forms and start to, you know, research and, you know, look at what can they do within those. It's just, to me, again, easy way be smarter than me and get some royalties out of it but that's the thing is in exactly the same as these uh, what you're talking with Richard there's this little idea find the people people are out there you can make it happen you can make all of these resources happen well I would like us all to give a warm round oh I think we're, we need to let um, let you go. We so deeply appreciate your time, and I hope that you'll be willing to stay for a couple of more minutes for those who might have been a little bit shy in coming up front to raising their hand and taking this to ask a question. They might come up and ask you. And also, don't forget that um, for those of you who are students, you have the opportunity to take a wonderful class with Alison Taylor McBride, particularly her uh, one credit First Nations materials class, and also that. Um, uh, Deb Martell is here at UBC with us at the Longhouse, so you can en engage her, come visit her. If you haven't been to the Longhouse yet, a wonderful excuse. She's like, oh, no, my schedule's busy enough. <laughs> Don't send more people, but we know where the good ideas are. <laughs> so, well, um, But let's give them a warm round of welcome, and thank you. <laughs> <laughs>